that politicians sometimes might take decisions that, you know, serving officers are only human, serving soldiers might not actually like, but that it's irrelevant because you're serving the crown. Is, am I over, am I over well, interpreting I, that? I it, think it, possibly, because yeah. of course the armed forces would recognise that it is yeah. government that gives the instructions. Yeah. So they are the forces, they, you know, the government acts in the name of the crown also, yeah. so yeah. it's all coming from the same source. Yeah. But the point is the armed forces, you know, have their allegiance to the top, yeah. not to some point elsewhere. And that's a meaningful thing, you know, as, as a serving soldier and officer. That, that Very much so, and of course it's also brought out by the close relationship between the sovereign as the commander-in-chief of all parts of the armed forces, but also all, many members of the royal family who have positions, uh, you know, honorary positions with particular bits of it. And I guess that's the point of all this ceremony in a way. It's the manifestation of that. It's not, it's not you know, for any other purpose. It's a reflection of that loyalty, really. Yes, that's right. In, his, in the simplest terms. And the close relationship, not, not the loyalty one way, but the loyalty yeah. both ways. Yeah. Yes, the Queen, as indeed are now king, takes a great deal of interest in the regiments. Um, there's a very <clears throat> close relationship with them, and um, certainly in my time of knowing the king, uh, during the course of the Afghan war, uh, he was constantly uh, writing to soldiers who were injured and had come back. He would often make private visits to the hospitals in Birmingham to, to visit them. Uh, I know of uh, many occasions where you know, he sent a, a bottle of whiskey uh, to, to, um, to somebody who you know, has come back having had some awful experience. Um, and through that, getting a sense of what it's like for literally the boots on the ground. And, um, and, 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 and of course, that experience and that knowledge, he, as indeed his mother, will feed back into those conversations, private conversations he will have with the Prime Minister once a week, if those issues are raised. So, and let's not forget his own military service. Indeed, so, yes. so he's got the experience coming from actually having done it as well. I mean, I'm assuming it's, a, you know, the recent tradition has been members of the royal family or those who are, you know, directly with the possibility of coming I mean, like obviously King Charles now served, his son, both his sons served. And there's a clear logic to that tradition, right? It's, it's, it's I suppose it just reinforces the closeness of both. I think that's right. I think it's a very good career for um, young members of the royal family. Uh, because, it, because it's an environment in which they will be sort of educated and looked after uh, in, in a way that will help them for this, this sort of thing later on, giving them that ground-level experience uh, before they become the figurehead. I think that's very valuable. And I guess, not to put too fine a point on it, given meaningful work, which is not always possible in every other... I mean, obviously, they go on to do their charitable work, which is, uh, you know, deeply meaningful in all the obvious ways, but, it, you know, they, there's a million and one jobs they can't realistically go and do. But whereas, you know, Harry famously is flying Apaches, I mean, you know, that's many, that's right. many millions of pounds of government kit. You don't, you know, you can't get much... Yeah, on active service. On active service, and, you know, you know, Prince William, you know, flying Air and Sea Rescue, which... As anyone who's ever witnessed one in a yes. hell of a storm is extremely dangerous and and and, and no fun at all. So it, you know the, the, there was a kind of reality to actually what both of them did. Yes, and I think the opportunity to work in a small team on equal terms, mm. which which is not what you can do later on when you're king. You know you'll never be on equal yeah. terms again with anybody. Yeah. Uh, but when you're um, when you're, you know, at the training, uh, doing your naval training in his case, say, or, uh, or um, at Sandhurst, or in an Apache crew, or in an air sea rescue crew, or air ambulance, which Prince William did later on, um, you, you are absolutely equal, equal, you know, and you're getting that experience well, as well. I'm also guessing that if you're, you know, Prince Charles and you're a young naval officer, the sailors are probably interested in the fact that you're going to be king for about five minutes and then lose all interest <laughs> in that and like, well, the only thing is, well, are you going to be a good officer or not? Because actually when you're, you know, when you're on a ship for days and weeks and months on end, yeah. you know, what else matters really? The fact your royalty is presumably proven. So in that sense, it's a very real test, right? That said, I'm sure they would have been very proud to have had him <laughs> yeah. as captain of yeah. his... Uh, I think a mine clearance vessel, wasn't it? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sure they were. But you're right, you know, they had to work. 
Yeah. There's no, there's no sort of extra captain because he was on. He yeah. was the captain. Yeah. No, I was very struck by um, <clears throat> Princess Anne talking about her father's experience in the Navy and what, what he learned and what he passed on to her. And she talked very powerfully about uh, the, the sense of discipline that it, it gave him. And also, as Bill was saying, you know, when you're at sea and the waves are coming over you, it doesn't matter who you are, you've got to pull yeah. together. And that can-do attitude, I think, came from, for him, came from that time that he spent in the Navy. And, and, and also just going beyond your own feelings, you know, the sense of duty, the ramrod straight attitude that you have to take in the military, and you, you, you go the extra mile. I, I have seen that uh, in my experience of working with Arnau King yeah. uh, coming to the fore, you know, um, flying back from America overnight and straight into a series of engagements. Uh, Can I just ask know. you about one other thing, Ian, while you were here, as we watch the, um, <coughs> the end of this uh, ceremonial. Um, yeah, Paul Smith, I think they're finished, at least, Bill, <laughs> if they haven't. You might have something to say to them. I, I uh, they're too hot. Yeah, yes. yeah, certainly are pretty hot. And we're looking at Gibraltar as well. They're finishing up there. So the, the 96 salutes have been made. But, Ian, I wanted to ask you about... We've just been told that the Accession Council is going to be televised. This is the first time in history. Um, I mean, this, the Accession Council takes a lot of explaining to people. It's fair to, I'm presenting it tomorrow, so I I'm, I'm, have that task. But that's interesting that it's going to be televised, right, as an example of change, I guess. That's a massive <clears throat> um, uh, change, yes. It's always been a private event. That will have been his decision. He will have signed that off. And... Um, uh, yes, it's a very special thing. I mean, he is king. He, you know, he became king the moment uh, that the Queen died. But what we will see tomorrow is the Privy Councillors um, assembling to essentially acknowledge the fact. Um, and, and, and that's uh, an important moment. Uh, we'll see some pretty archaic... Uh, uh, ceremonial type place. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. Yes, I'm one sure might you're... politely call it the return to the 30th century. But <laughs> well, we might say that because 